speakers here. The Center for Visual Art acknowledges the privilege we have to gather in this place, once the territories and homelands of so many indigenous peoples, including the Arapaho and Cheyenne nations. We respect the many diverse indigenous peoples still connected to this land and value the knowledge systems they have developed in relationship to their lands. We understand that offering a land acknowledgement neither absolves settler colonial privilege nor diminishes colonial structures of violence at either the individual or institutional level. Land acknowledgements must be accompanied with ongoing commitments to displaced indigenous and immigrant communities. In order to learn more about the spatial relationships of indigenous communities to land, we re recommend visiting nativeland.ca and exploring the interactive map. As the off-campus art center for MSU Denver, the Center for Visual Art acts as a resource for students and the broader community through contemporary exhibitions of local significance and global reach an immersive edu education program and workforce development for students interested in creative fields. And I would add to that also the site of the Bachelor of Fine Arts exhibitions, which you are sitting amongst right now. Okay, so a descendant from a matrilineal lineage of Cochiti Pueblo ceramic artists, and for over two decades, Virgil Ortiz has told the story of the 1680 Pueblo Revolt through his artwork, simultaneously joining traditional pottery forms with sci-fi fantasy. In Colorado alone, he's had numerous exhibitions, including a solo exhibit at the Denver Art Museum in 2015, titled Revolt 1680-2180. Virgil Ortiz, a 2018 exhibit at the Colorado Fine Arts Center, Revolution, Rise Against the Invasion, and he is currently showing in duality contemporary works by indigenous artists at the Longmont Museum of Art. In 2020, 2022, Ortiz received the Living Treasure Award from the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. And opening this May at History Colorado, is Revolt 1680-2180 Virgil Ortiz Runners and Gliders, which uh, Virgil and A History Colorado very war warmly welcomed the professional practice class um, to visit today. So we got to see the installation in progress. And thank you so much for, for that opportunity. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Virgil Ortiz to the CBO. Thank you, so hi for that intro. And thanks for the invitation to come hang out with you guys here at CVA. Cicely, thank you so much. Um, and also Jeremy Morton from HC. Thanks for having us here. We're, it was so cool because earlier we had like about what, 10 students or so that came over to the um, History of Colorado. So I wanted to show them the behind the scenes a little tour of like what it takes to put together a whole exhibition and the amount of people it takes to put together is like really cool for them to see it and experience it. And like, there's like so many people that are involved, like doing all the projections, doing the 3D mapping, the augmented reality. Sebastian Bustos, my team member from Albuquerque, hasn't made it here yet. He's on a flight right now, but um, it's really cool to have this experience or to give you guys and show you what we're working on in our team and it's really cool. Everything that I do is based on the 1680 Pueblo Revolt. And do you guys know what that is? Any, any hands raising? Like we talked about that earlier, but it's about the uh, rise up of indigenous Pueblo people from New Mexico. And a long time ago, um, in 1680, there was many uh, battles before the big battle of 1680 when they actually pushed out all the invaders from um, our, all the Pueblos that were spread out in New Mexico. Back then there was like 43 Pueblos, but now there's 19 Pueblos that are left in New Mexico today. So when the invaders first arrived to our area, they had destroyed a lot, a lot of our artwork, um, saying that it was um, um, sorcery and witchcraft and replaced it with uh, Catholicism, idols and saints and started taking over all of the resources and looking for riches and um, gold basically but 
the Pueblos people re welcomed them and took care of them from their long journey to our area. And eventually started getting worse of um, genocide and bloodshed that happened and enslaving our Pueblo people to build churches on all, all the Pueblos. So there was um, battles to make, make that stop. But the final big battle was in 1680. And our, one of our Pueblo leaders by the name of Pope, he was out of OK Wingate Pueblo, which is just north of Santa Fe. Um, he devised a plan for the Pueblo revolt. So to bring together all the Pueblos, he sent his runners from the northern, um, uh, northern, the most northern Pueblo all the way down to the southern Pueblos. And all these runners were instructed to carry knotted cords, leather cords with knots on it. And they distributed it all, all through all these Pueblos and they instructed the, um, the heads of the Pueblo the Pueblos to untie one knot every morning. So when the left, uh, last knot was untied, then that's um, they rose up and they pushed all the invaders out of each Pueblo. So that's how the America's first revolution was pulled off and nobody hardly knows about it because um, it's not written in um, our history books or taught in classes. So my whole life is based on um, educating globally about the Pueblo revolt using artwork. So I was born into a family of, of um, potters on my mother's side. Our mother's side of the family, our grandmother, great grandmother, mothers were all potters. So I grew up in a family. Our mom was a potter and our dad was a drum maker, Guadalupe and Seferino Ortiz. And here's a picture of our um, family that are family members that are creating using traditional methods and materials. And it's a dying art form right now because a lot of people that they um, have normal jobs and they work outside of the Pueblo, so it's really hard for them to use traditional methods and materials. And when I say that, I mean that we have to go collect our clay, we have to go dig up our own clay, collect all the materials, and it takes a year to process all these materials. So everything that you see with our traditional work, it's all from, from the Earth Mother, and it takes a year to do this. So if you hadn't grown up doing this as a kid, which I did since I was six years old. We had samples when I was a kid doing these um, artworks uh, in clay. Um, it's really hard to get into it because like it takes a lot of amounts of time to dedicate to make a living off of artwork, as you guys all know, probably because you're here at this cool spot. You guys are probably all artists, but um, it was I would it just it was around me the whole time and I had no idea that it was art that we're creating on a daily basis. I'd wake up, our mom would be creating um, clay on our kitchen table, which was her studio. So it was always around me after class, after school. I would go back home and I would just jump into excited to go work with clay. And all my friends would be like, well, aren't you gonna come out and play? And I was like, no, I'd rather go draw and like you know work with clay, but um, I thought everybody was doing it and when I came to be about 15, I realized that not everybody did art in, on a daily basis. So um, one of a uh, collector by the name of Robert Guy goes out of Albuquerque, which is like 50 miles from Santa Fe. He would make buying trips from uh, for his uh, his company. He was a dealer and he would he knew he knew me since I was like six years old and he watched what um, he knew it was also a dying art. So he, he was really close with all the families that did make the pottery and he kept an eye on who was going to continue this tradition. So slowly it started to die out and what was traditional over in Cochiti Pueblo was a storyteller figure. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but it's like a seated mother or grandmother, grandfather, even animals that carry um, babies and they're telling them stories. And this is how we um, hand down our, our language. Um, our language is not written. And this is how we keep our tradition going. So that became um, popular and became traditional for Koji de Pueblo. But I learned how to do that and to make the pots with uh, geometrical designs of Earth's elements. And I learned all that, but I guess I got kind of bored or something. I don't know what happened, but I was like 15. Then I started to create different types of figurative pottery or animals and started designing their clothing on them because they became interested in fashion as well. So my designs completely changed from my what I was taught. Um, so Robert Gallegos, 
the collector was asking my parents, like, who's teaching this kid how to do all these different types of sculpture when he's doing and like he's teaching them stuff. And my parents had my back and said, he, he was just experimenting. So he said, can you bring him down to Albuquerque to the showroom? And at that point, none of our family had ever gone to his showroom because he would make mind trips to her, to all the different um, potter's homes. And um, my parents um, decided like, okay, we're gonna go check it out. We went to his, his studio and when we walked into his studio, it, like blew our minds. Like we almost, I almost passed out and like my parents did too, but um, it turned out that he had the largest collection of uh, historic, like uh, figurative, Cochiti figurative pottery from the 1800s. So everything that I was, I was creating when I was 15 and 16 looked exactly like them without seeing them. So that was like an aha moment in my life of how like, what the hell is happening here? <laughs> and like tripping out on that. So um, at that point, I knew I was going to dedicate my life to play and to revive the, the style, or style of pottery. So going back to what what is just talking about, like how we create and collect all the different materials to uh, for our traditional pottery. We go to a certain spot, like who knows how long our family has been collecting pottery from these uh, the, the clay vein. And I remember like my cousins and I or my, my family, my siblings would always travel with our parents to go collect all these materials. So there's certain parts in the Pueblo that we have to go to these uh, these sacred spots. So we don't normally just go and like take as much as we can. We have to go there um, just realizing that who knows how many of our ancestors they've got the clay from this area. So we have to introduce ourselves, feed the uh, Earth Mother, ask permission, state our purpose, and take only as much as we can carry, and um, ask for guidance of, to make sure that this artwork stays alive. So we're overprotective of the all the materials that we get, and fill up the buckets that we can carry down because it's like a thirty-minute hike and up to the side of the mountain, back down to the uh, truck, fill it, and at that point we have to. Um, stick it in the in the barn and let it uh, dry out to bone dry because when we get out, out out of the earth, it's still it's still damp and it's um, so dense, like it's pure clay. We don't even have to like put it through a, a, a sieve or a screen or anything like that. So we dig it out and it comes out in, in clay lumps like you see there, and let it dry out till it's bone dry. Take it out, crush it out, and I'm explaining it to you right now because you'll see a video that's five minutes that um, condenses it from a year's work, then you'll know what's happening. So we crush it all up into like quarter inch size pieces, uh, put it in a plastic bin, fill some water with it, and then slowly when the when you pour the water over it, it starts to absorb it and it rehydrates itself. Because if you're to try to soak the pieces right when you get it out of the ground, when it's so damp, it's so dense, like it's not gonna, it's not gonna, no matter how long you live in the water, it's still going to um, be stuck to itself to have pure clay um, rocks in it, right? So what we want to do is like dry it out completely, rehydrate it so it's all even, evenly saturated. Then uh, we go to another part of the Pueblo, which is the bottom left image, is to get a um, kind of a grog, but we call it temper. And it's like palmistone, stone, volcanic ash that we have to take out. And that too also comes out pretty, um, pretty fine. Uh, take that back home, uh, throw on our combat boots um, to get traction, lay down some canvas, dance on it basically, and then it crushes already to a fine powder. And then that, the temper, we put it through two screens and then it, get, it comes out like baby powder. So once you have your clay soaking for like over two weeks and it starts to pull away from the plastic bin, then it's ready to be mixed. So you mix the clay with the temper and then, like um, like I said, we're overprotective of this. So if I know I have an order or like an intention of making like a medium-sized pot, I know exactly the amount of clay that I need to to mix. Um, we don't have any exact like the amounts of uh, in the ingredients that we put into it. We kind of test it with uh, once you mix it the first time, you run your finger through it, then it's um, you could see the strokes that it leaves like if it's too if it's super sleek then you add more of the volcanic ash or then it starts to get gritty then it's the perfect mixture 
So roll into a ball, create your piece, and all of our pieces are um, coil and scrape method. So all of the walls are about a quarter inch thick. Um, they um, they have to be all the same thickness because we pit fire. Pit fire is the last process in what we do. So there's only one firing. So we have to have it all the same thickness because it expands and contracts. Um, once, because it's a quick fire, maybe like three hours from the beginning to the end. So heats up really quick, clo um, uh, cools, cools down really quick. So it has to have the thin walls like that. Um, if there's any air bubbles in it, it'll blow up. <laughs> so um, once we like go through um, sculpting it, then it dries, hopefully with no cracks, then we sand it. Take a light coating of water to remove all of the um, the dust from it. And now that it's all dust free and smooth, then we stick it in the oven. If you can fit it in your normal oven, 350, like you're making some cookies or something. But you heat it up and then you apply another white clay slip. The red clay is, is all red, a red clay body. But the white clay slip is, to, um, is put on like a 10 layer. So like it's heated up, you put it on really thin, evaporates and it sticks to it, and then starts to go on the porousness of everything. Um, just repeat that process till it complete, uh, turns completely white. Once it's all white um, and cooled down, then we take a, a cotton rag and rag polish it. So it goes from a very matte surface to a, a super glossy surface. And you cannot touch it no matter how many times you wash your hands at that point, because if you're to leave a space that is going to be white and you accidentally touch it after you're eating like Doritos or something, <laughs> then you won't even know until after the firing, you'll have a big old smudge. So it's, uh, it's kind of funny because like my younger nieces and nephews know that they're not supposed to touch the pieces when we're working on them at that point. But when you fire them, yeah, you see little tiny fingerprints. You're like, ah, I told you not to do that. But it's kind of cool to have them there at the same time because they're learning the process and they're with us. So it's really cool to see that. It's like a signature. So I'm like, oh, you're going to be a potter when you grow up. <laughs> but um, once it's um, ready, polished, and it's ready to, to be uh, decorated. So our traditional colors are black, white, and red at Kojiti. And the black paint is the only vegetal part of the whole process, and that's made out of wild spinach. So on the right side of the image, when the purple flowers bloom, then that's like an alarm clock for to gather the family and go pick it. And this is like a crazy hard thing to do because if you miss the blooming of that, then you like, uh, we prepare all these materials once a year. So you have to hit at the right spot. And when we harvest them, we pick like eight, 33 gallon size bags of just the leaves, like no stems. We just have to get the leaves. And I always ask my mom, like, why, why do we, can't we just cut up the whole thing, like totally uh, put it in a food processor or something and just like use the stems and everything. She was like, no, you just only the leaves. Yeah, and of course I didn't listen and I tried it. So I like, it takes us like about two weeks to make a big batch and I lost the whole batch. So it's like, oh, mom, that was right. So, <laughs> so we, um, once we get the, the bag spool. Then we have like the sample in here was like a really small batch, so it's probably like about a week's worth of, to make the black paint. But we take it outside and we put it into big um, water, uh, I mean, uh, pots full of water boiling, and then we just cook the leaves. And once about it, once about maybe around the third or fourth day, then it starts to disintegrate. Then we just scoop it out with cotton rags, twist it, strain it, get the, all the all the leaves out, and then what we're after is just the juice. So once we have the juice, like starting off from like six big old pots of boiling water, now we have like about maybe just one pot, and then uh, that's just continuous boiling. So like I always tell people that I work with, like thank God I have forty-four nieces and nephews now, great nieces and nephews. So. The younger ones can stay up all night to watch the fire and, and help me do that. But the last part, it finally condenses and it boils down to like about a gallon. And then I take over then and I take it inside. It's getting really thick like molasses, right? So uh, you have to watch it really closely because if you burn this at that point, it will not stick to the polished um, white clay slip of the clay body. So you've wasted another two weeks if you burn it. <laughs> So you have to watch it really closely at that point. And then it's almost like if you guys like make like the red candy apples, like it's kind of molten and very like that texture. 
then you have to pull it off the fire and then we distribute it onto corn husks and that's how we dry it. So on the like around the six month mark, it's still like soft, like tacky, you could kind of bend it within the corn husk. But uh, around the year mark, it's, it turns like to a Jolly Rancher. So it's like really hard. Sometimes it comes out green, sometimes it comes out brown. But uh, when we're gonna paint up our pots, then we crack little pieces off, crush it up, rehydrate it, and that's what we used to decorate it for. So now we take it outside to pit fire and we use aspen, cedar, and cow manure. And um, pit fire is usually like underground, but like we just call it pit fire, but it's above the ground like eight inches. And the ground has to be completely bone dry as well. So it's really hard to fire in the monsoon season or during the winter. It's possible, but you have to burn the ground first to make sure that everything's all nice and dry. Um, you, we take out the, the metal grate and then we put a kiln shelf on it and we fire only one piece at a time. All of our pots are fired upside down and our figures are standing up. So we have one piece on there, then we cover that piece, leaving about five inches around it for breathing room with chicken wire. And then you cover the whole thing with bone dry cow manure. And now it looks like a big igloo. And you have to ignite it from each side evenly. So I need help every time I fire that. And again, my nephew nephews help me to do that. You have to um, ignite it evenly so that the fire and the flame goes straight up and it pulls the smoke up with it to um, kind of avoid the smoke, uh, making small marks on the pot. So it starts to ignite and it's just like just the wood, or just the wood is burning as a fuel. But at a certain point, maybe about an hour in, then the cow manure catches fire. So it turns into a big, huge um, bonfire and we stop feeding it the wood. So then it burns from the outside inward and that creates our kiln. So after and then you just at that point, you just pray you don't hear any like thuds or snaps or cracks because you can't see the piece, of course, right? And all of you guys that work with clay, you guys know like the same sound, like you're like, oh my God, my piece blew up. But uh, once you fire it, you let it cool down, you take it, out, um, take the cage off and the cow manure is still intact. It's all ashes now. Take it off, it all falls to pieces and you realize that if your piece has survived or not. So now the piece has now transformed from like a green or brown translucent paint to completely black. Um, so it has ashed over, so you have to wipe it off again. And um, it's good to go at that point because if you handle it, your natural oils will give a patina to it. But to speed up that process, we use animal fat or egg white. So it gives it like just putting lotion on our skin is the same effect. Um, so here's the, the video of a year's work all smashed into Five minutes. Hopefully, I can do this. She said double click, right? Thank <laughs> you. 
One year. <laughs> so this is a sample of where, um, what is talking about the firing process. So we have all our nieces, nephews, our sisters to help us do that. Um, another way we learn how to fire is like one of our nephews is a metalsmith, so he made us uh, metal containers that we could use during the um, winter time. But you, you have to use like twice the amount of, um, <laughs> of, of fuel because it is metal, so, but it still works. Here's a sample of the storyteller that I was talking about earlier and also with the, um, the bear storyteller. Sample of uh, my mom's piece holding a drum and our dad was a drum maker, so you often make little accessories for my mom's pieces. My grandmother's on the right hand side and mine in the middle um, <laughs> with, I don't know, like with a short haircut with breasts and a bow tie and like I was six years old when I made that, <laughs> which is kind of funny, but um, it's pretty cool. And so like, my uh, style started to change, so I started using the the pots to really design, like I love black line tattoos, so like I've designed many tattoos, so it's kind of like really practicing on the clay. Um, and then like I told you, it was a dying art form and it's like, how the hell am I going to like make the uh, help the next generation latch onto it and learn from it? So it's like a revival of the social commentary and giving voice back to the clay because a lot of the pieces were broken, like I said earlier. So this piece, uh, this photograph was from Ben Wittick, a photographer, which he took in the late 1800s. And the first time I seen this when I was about 16 after I decided to just um, uh, live to create clay. Um, I said, I really want to remake this picture. And it just was bur um, burning my brain. So I asked my family members, I said, okay, like pick, look at this picture and pick a piece that you want to recreate. And these pieces were like up to three feet tall, which was unheard of in Kojiti. Like right now, it's still hard to get that big just because of the, um, the firing process. So I said, we're going to bring back these pieces that we had access to to look at. And, hold and look at the paint, uh, the, how they painted it through our friend Bob Gallegos at, in his showroom. And so I said, we have like a, a, like a month and a half to do this, let's all do it. So my, all my whole family did it. And then this is what the result was. So um, the backdrop painting in the first picture on the left-hand side was on a canvas. And that was like an old Santa Fe trail down in, in, in Santa Fe. And when I was making, uh, or when I was actually, I was doing, I don't remember what it was, but in Prague on the right hand side, this bridge, the St. Charles Bridge, reminded me of the backdrop painting. So I started snapping pictures with the intention that I was going to use that as a background. So when I got home and we had all the pieces done, there was like 22 pieces. And we had them, um, and they were big pieces. So like we're, it was super scary to take a picture of them because we set up boxes and like fake um, bear skin. Had my nephews go get some sand from the fields where we collect um, the the wild spinach plants, and we had them all tied up so they won't fall over with um, with fishing water. <laughs> it was it was like it was very scary to do that, but got the picture, cut it out, took it into Photoshop, cut it out, and then placed the background in. So it was pretty cool. And now this piece um, resides at in Cartier, Paris, and. Yeah, in Paris for it is in the permanent collection. So that was an uh, awesome um, project to do with my family. Here's a sample of some of the larger pots that I did with the geometrical design. So it incorporates a lot of Earth's elements with not only the clouds, the thunder, the rain, um, wild spinach plants. Um, this is what Kojini pottery looks like, but then I started it was all based on social commentary, the pieces from Kojiti. So they our people created a timeline. When more people came into our area, they started creating caricatures in clay and capturing, say, like opera singers or the traveling circus type shows that came through the area. So you see these cool pieces from the 1800s that have tattoos all over the place or conjoined twins and just all these things that you would imagine in an old school circus. So that was like my intention. So, um, but at a certain time, it was um, put to a stop because uh, Victorian attitudes didn't like that when they found out it was caricatures of themselves. So, like, ah, you guys can't make this anymore. So, that style died out. But when I was 15, and what I told you about, like, to see, did I tell you about this? I don't know if I'm repeating myself. 
is too about like going to Bob Gallegos' place and seeing the whole um, looked exactly like it, right? So I was like, okay, I'm going to use this exact um, storyline of what our people did is to um, social commentary. So that left the door wide open. So now I'm taking my pieces to within the political scene and really commenting on what was happening. And I made this piece was um, in 2016 and it was a, of a politician that at uh, that time was us commenting on the, um, on the Dakota Access Pipeline. So the black snake represents the pipeline with the politician holding bundles of cash, but the snake coming to bite him in the back. You turn the pot a little bit, then you see fracking and slowly the snake infiltrating the body and eating him from the inside out. And the last image is a, a picture of a woman's hand taking this politician out. So that was kind of my prediction of what's happening. And also, this is called cyberbully. And it's um, the cyberbully is sitting on the can tweeting at 5 a.m. So that was another prediction piece of what would happen. Um, and what was me go down with the classic, you know, the hair. And, <laughs> and then also comment, can you, uh, commenting on the LGBT community. And this piece was called Hate is a Drag. So like a bunch of friends that I do that are, are drag queens, I commented and uh, made, we made them in clay. Slowly I started to get into actually manufacturing um, leather handbags and clothing. And also using like the clay to uh, make sketches of what, what I wanted to create in, in fashion, but also making fashion pieces and then, and then taking the clay and recreating it that way. So it just always influenced itself back and forth. I got to work with Donna Karen, like I told the students earlier that came over to the um, History Colorado, but here's a sample of the Donna Karen collaboration that I did with her on the left side. But it helped me to de develop my line and with Tisha Goya, my manager, like we figured out how to do like all the different um, silk scarves. Someone was wearing one earlier. <laughs> and thank you for wearing that. Um, but it's just really cool to go work with a designer of that magnitude and see how our team works together and really figure out your way if you want to do a fashion line. And once we released that fashion line, I almost passed out because the main model was Mila Jovovich. So it was like um, Lilu from Fifth Element, right? <laughs> and it was really cool and um, she gave me huge props and she used to do a magazine um, through the Donna Karen company. So um, gave my whole backstory and she, um, once we put all my designs onto her, her fabrics, we're able to tell the story of where it came from. So that helped me reach a bunch of fashion used to people who had no idea where OGD was or where did, what these, these designs were about. And that was my podium to be able to talk to all these fashion people and say like, this is where we're coming from and direct people back to uh, this fashion is send people back to our people in Kochi and say like you know there's other people other artists there that she could support so that was a major um, break for me to work with her and slowly I started picking up all different types of media uh, to work with and utilizing different mediums I was able to do photography body painting fashion combine it all with Photoshop so now it's really helping me develop a, a screenplay um, doing lithographs as well, always concentrating on developing the next character. Then it goes into hospitality design, doing carpet and for all the different uh, hotels and stuff that are in Vegas. So I was able to work with a company called um, um, Project Dynamics. So they rebuild a bunch of different um, hotels in Vegas. So that was amazing to do. And they just challenged me. They said, what would your suite look like? I said, here you go. <laughs> and they had access to all the manufacturers. So I was able to do like mirrors, desks, the chairs, the uh, love seats, the duvet covers, the headboards, the wallpaper, everything that you'll see in a hotel room. And that's what it looked like. Um, so now, like we said earlier, it's like, how do educate the world about what happened to our people? What will capture the next generation's attention? I was like, oh shit, no film script, sorry. <laughs> so I said, okay, so now um, I'm like, okay, let's go really push all these characters. And I designed 19 groups of characters to represent the 19 Pueblos that are left in New Mexico today. So that's where I first started. So I started because uh, I, I loved like Star Wars and 
uh, Star Trek and Battlestar Galactica, all these sci-fi stuff when I was a kid. I was six years old when I seen the first Star Wars, and it was amazing to me that I remember when I reminisced because like, I think uh, me and my family seen the Star Wars movie when it first came out, like all we stayed in the in the theater like all day long. <laughs> we did pay, by the way. <laughs> but it was just so cool to just like learn from there and like all of a sudden I came out of the theater saying like, oh my God, I know this character. I know where they're from, what ship they drove, like how they talk, how they dress. So I was like, okay, I'm going to put that same kind of idea into developing a story about the public revolt happening in two Titan dimensions in 1680 and 2180. So that helps me um, because I'm not an academic person and that helps me really um, be able to tell the story of the public revolt using film or any kind of medium that I, artwork that I work in. So what these characters are doing, a lot of them are coming back from 2180 to the present time and historic times, and they're collecting a bunch of our, our um, songs, our traditions, our way of life, our, um, our language, and taking those shards and the, all that information to 2180 storing them or protecting them so that when we get to that timeline, all of our traditions and our ceremonies and everything that we do are still alive. So that's incorporating that into indig indigenous futurism. But of course, being like a sci-fi freak, now it lets me really design all of these uh, really cool characters. And like through the movies that are in film right now, like the Avengers or um, Black Panther was talking about earlier, it's like really, paying attention to people of color. And I really um, want to thank everybody for having me here in Denver and giving me the chance to um, invite you guys in to learn about who we are as bubble people. Um, samples of body painting and all my friends I use um, to do this. And we have a blast in my studio trying to get the right shot, shooting them and then bringing in Photoshop to really make it look like, well, to develop the characters as much as I could. I'm thinking of movie posters that what it will look like. Uh, the Venusian soldiers were some of the characters that um, in the in the film script, the Republic gets bombed first in the future. So that's why they're wearing all the gas masks and the breathing tubes. But their journey is to um, relocate to Pueblo and find uh, try, uh, to find some uh, breathable air. Again, taking these characters and then having them interact with the pottery and putting their images on it. Some samples of how I make my graphics. And really thinking about all my sisters and all, um, like even Tish, like strong level women that helped me pull this storyline off and making the head character of women, women empowerment and being kick ass warriors that you guys all are. So you can see the real strength in the uh, women empowerment movement here. But it's just fun to really push all the different types of materials you can work with. Like the center figure was made from um, billboards that I did a show at Fine Arts College, I mean Fine Arts Center in Colorado Springs. After that show came down, this was a recycled fashion show. So I was able to get all the billboards and recreate them into fashion. June Kaneko, I don't know if you guys know him. He's like a really well-known ceramicist, but he does like huge ceramic pieces that are 15 feet tall and over. And he was one of the inspirations that um, I got invited to go work at the Archie Berry Foundation up in Atlanta, Montana. And that's really hard to get into, but I was so lucky and I accepted. And I said, okay, my main goal was to create really huge pieces because I was limited to using the traditional clay. But once I figured out how to, or when I was first introduced into high fire clay, I had no idea, like there was like, red clay, I mean, different colors of clay, textures and everything that all the different glazes compared to just using black, white and red, right? I was so excited, like a kid in a candy store, just buying all kinds of stuff and looking at all the tools that they had. And I said, okay, I'm gonna push myself and really go for it. So here's me working at the Archie Bray and like really going as big as I could. Um, some examples of what came out of the Archie Bray and some of the pieces that are going to be released at the History Colorado. So those pieces will be like four to five foot, five feet tall. And that's super hard to do. And well, I think it is in, in clay. <laughs> uh, one of my best friends, Justin Reese, um, he's like six, five. So he was, he was able to help me 
build all these pieces and where those long arms could get on the inside and coil and scrape because I couldn't, I almost probably fell in a couple of them. <laughs> but um, to have, use the resources of the R2 Ray, like with the huge kilns and all the, the heavy equipment that would lift heavy, like 600 pound pieces, right? It was so cool to work there. Samples of when we're standing on, on stools trying to get in there. But it was just amazing to be able to think and create and just push yourself. Every student that I work with, I always tell them, like, there's no more imaginary hurdles. Quit putting that up. And I spoke to all of you guys earlier that we're at the behind the scenes tour is like, that's a human nature to do is like self doubt. So they're like, oh my God, the first thing is like, I can't do it. I was like, the first thing is like, okay, you're already degrading yourself. Like, don't put up imaginary hurdles because they're never there to begin with. So don't be afraid of failing because all those are, are the perfect lessons. They're our best teachers. So fail as much as you can, you're gonna learn that much quicker. So just go for it and don't hold yourself back. Some of them went after they're fired. Um, really experimenting with the color and the type of glaze application. Um, but yeah, you'll see some of these pieces at HC once they come out uh, for in, on May 18th. A sample of this size, um, one of my friends, Su Jin Choi, um, that was also a resident of that Archie Bray. So I was like, please stand next to them and get a picture like to show, you know, the size of them. So, I mean, this whole thing is basically a, a revolution in clay guided by, by my ancestors, our family. Really taking it to the next level of developing the Recon Watchmen, which is going to be a focus at um, runners and gliders as well. But taking plaster molds of my friends um, faces um, putting them, um, sculpting using monster clay over it, and then really carving them to look like the actual pottery. And then make, using silicone and resins um, to make their masks. So after we got all that, then um, put a thin layer of masks. Like now you could just go buy them at like Party City or something, but of course they never had these characters there. So I had to make it myself. And that's what they look like. Once they're done so combining the fashion and the all the the foam fabrication their armor and everything the makeup so some samples of what they look like and we shot outdoors at the Bisti badlands in northern new mexico this place is so crazy if you guys have a chance to go check it out do it it's like insane they're like you're on another planet um so meow if you guys have one here but the original one was in santa fe it started so i got invited a bunch of their original members that are my friends so they invited me like to do uh little exhibition in it. So I was like, okay, I don't have no time, but we'll do it now. Last year was perfect. So we filmed all of these models wearing the costumes of the Recon Watchmen, made the pieces in clay, filmed them and everything. And just like another behind the scenes of what we're building at um, Yawa. So we use like wallpaper. We use like the huge head was like from the floor to the ceiling. We used um, foam and uh, what was that word again, Jeremy? Fiberglass, I, mean, I don't know why I can never remember that, but uh, fiberglass, and it was like another way of thinking because like uh, through Meow, if you guys like touch everything and climb on it or selfies and stuff, so it was a different way for me to think rather than having everything behind glass or a vitrine, right, like in galleries or, or museums, but I said, okay, I'm going to challenge myself to do that, so we built these big um, heads and then turned all the, the video um, that we filmed with all the costuming on. And it, was, it turned out to be a really cool exhibition at Santa Fe. So if you guys are down there, go check it out if you can. Um, so the next, so going through this whole process of having interact with the public, um, selfies and all that stuff, right? Then it comes to the show that I want to do at the History Colorado Center. It's called Runners and Gliders. Um, and this is just like a, a quick behind the scenes of what, how I bring the show together. But like the design concepts, like, it's amazing like to be able to work with the HC Center because like usually, I mean, I'm trying to teach all the different students that are getting to show in galleries or museums, like to really have the um, lines of communication completely open. You have to communicate with their designers, with the curators, the directors and speak your mind. And because like a lot of people that do shows, they give them the artwork and have no say so and then all of a sudden they just display it. But um, and sometimes that's a little bit disappointing, but other times they hit it on the spot. So you never know what you're going to get. 
But every time I do work with people, I ask them, like, is, is there any way I could help design? Can I do this? Here are my ideas before I, you know, uh, agree to it. And which was cool that um, Jeremy wasn't afraid. And I and he goes, I said, can I have the the layouts of the room? He sent it to me, and I, I completely they they're gonna gut it to begin with. So I like built walls and like said, okay, here you go. I'm gonna have a rejection room. I'm gonna have 3D mapping. I want to have videos going, like really huge artwork. And another thing that we're working on is using augmented reality. And one of my team members, Sebastian Bustos, he is out of Albuquerque and he knows how to work with all those AI and all the augmented reality, virtual reality stuff. So this is going to be the first show that really brings that to life. So you'll start seeing all these different advertisement around town, um, even projections on buildings. That's um, a possibility of what might happen. Crossing fingers. But um, it's really cool. So like when you go into a museum, like I want a big piece that's 20 foot tall, but that takes up a lot of retail space. So if you can do it through AR, augmented reality, like using your smartphone, um, you scan the piece and all of a sudden, like all these 10 foot tall photographs um, or the, 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 the photographs come alive. So you'll see like a double kind of installment at this museum when it opens so we're excited about that but just also utilizing their their um, mm -hmm. third collections of historic cochity pueblo pottery pieces have that in there to show the people like where it progressed from that time to what we're doing right now it's 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 so it's so fun to work with people that <coughs> believe with you believe in you and like are trusting of what you're doing what your vision is but this was the layout of what it was going to look like, or what it is going to look like. This was like when we first started. So um, they gave no, um, they, I mean, they agreed with everything that I designed. So I was very happy about that because <laughs> usually they're like, oh, you can't do that. You can't do this. But for them to trust me that much is a big, uh, it's a big thanks to them. Here's the title wall. So um, the images of the costuming, the models, and it's a um, I don't remember the dimensions of this of this piece, but when you go into the title wall, read what the museum is about. I mean, the exhibition's about. Then you take out your smartphone and scan it over. Then this piece will come alive. You go around the corner, then you'll see four big pedestals that have that are blank here, but they'll have like my um, forty-five foot tall um, ceramic busts on there. Um, the middle um, pedestal will have a, a wood obelisk that another friend, another student that I collaborated with uh, over at Anderson Ranch in Aspen. He's making a black obelisk with a silver cap tip, but you shine your phone at that, then it, all of a sudden like a 10 foot tall um, levitating, rotating bus will appear. So it's just really um, thinking and taking a line of what's available now to AR and all the stuff that you see on Instagram is pretty insane to get it to it. So. That's pretty cool, but these are just the mock-ups of what I wanted the, the museum to look like. And it was so cool that now it looks like the whole piece is all cement, um, but it's um, it's just a faux cement. It's an artist that they hired to come in and really texturize, texturize and look like the cement walls. But when you aim it at that piece, like there's nothing there on the runway called this little thing, um, this little pedestal, but when you do your AR, then all of a sudden like one of the characters will pop up. Uh, also, the behind the scenes of all the mannequins, what that's going to look like. So all of the all of these costuming that you see in throughout this presentation, you'll see a lot of the um, costuming there. And that is my presentation. And you guys, I mean, I'm, I do a lot of the um, I do a lot of the behind the scenes and everything on Instagram. So if you guys have any questions, reach out to me that way. If you have any questions, cool. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>
it'll wipe off or it won't come out white. So this is like, it's crazy that that only that material works with this material. So yeah, it's separate from the, the from the polymer store. I hope you guys can all make it to the opening on it's Thursday, May 18th. So we're gonna we're gonna have a good time, and I think we're doing a, a panel discussion at MSU, right? I think what what time what time is that? Do you know about that? Oh, I don't know. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but there's gonna be a panel discussion with one of my other friends, Greg Deal. So we'll be talking about it. It's it's gonna be a pretty cool discussion because they're hosting um, they're hosting a seminar that is um, from the American. Alliance, oh, wait, American Museum Alliance. So like all the directors, all the curators will be coming to Denver for this seminar. So they're throwing a party over at HC. So we get they, all those people get to see the show. And it's like it's a little bit nerve wracking, but oh well, this is how it goes. <laughs> Yeah. It's a feature film we're working on. So I've been doing it for over two decades now. <laughs> so I was like, what? Over 20 years? Of, but it is like all the different shows that we've done. And it's the reason why we did this. I'm taking baby steps is because, again, I didn't go to school for anything. So I don't know anything about film, but. The more people um, and more talks that you do, you attract those people. You know, you send your your um, rocket of desire out there. Like, I want to meet people. I want to meet people in the movie industry. And then all of a sudden, people knock on your door, email you. Then you get to meet more people from the movie industry. But um, it's all about developing and protecting your intellectual property. So all of you guys that are artists, make sure you pay attention to that. It's like another big lesson that I try to Enforce and instill in, in students that I work with is to protect your intellectual property. If you're gonna, if you plan your life on being an artist, really make sure that you take that time. It costs money to do that, a little bit of money, but then in the end, like you're protected under copyrights, trademarks, and registered marks, and um, it, it's it's a it's an investment in yourself. So uh, make sure to pay attention to that because like now the social networks, yeah, it's like free to advertising. It's a good thing, but also. A lot of people look at your stuff and they'll snag it from you. So you're at least you're prepared to, um, in a lawyer sense of way, to protect your intellectual property. But yeah, um, we're working on the film. I'm looking at your images, but there's musical inspiration too. Are you excited to music? Yeah, I'm looking at your music. Yeah, like all the different, a lot of the music stuff. Um, music parts of everything that I do and like the scores and stuff I, I make the music with helps and collaborations through some of my friends um, so I was I don't know I should learn this but I don't remember like the, um, the it's mostly electro music that goes with it but a bunch of my friends are musicians and we record little snippets for them they send me clips and then I rearrange everything and um, remastered and make the, the soundtrack for all of these uh, different projects that we do. So there'll be like a six minute uh, music version that comes out at History Colorado in the projection room. Um, going along with, again, like it's, I think about the artwork as a, like a whole um, storyboard. So all the different shows, like I'm developing the characters more and more and more. So each show that I do each season or whatever you call it, then I make sure that I, we have to enter all that stuff into our trademark attorneys and have the backing of say a museum say like we release it in 2023 or whatever 24 that we're doing like art basil but it's all categorized and it's all done the legal way so that you're protecting yourself but yeah music is included in that i love bumping out and rocking out in the in the studio <laughs> i'm just curious about working with a form of activism that relies on futurity mm -hmm. and also working with places like History Museum and creating the same fictional uh, stories that's based on the future and I just wanted to know the process of just how you kind of go to the past and present and future 
I, yeah, I get what you're saying. I started like doing when I first wrote the movie script, like happening into the two different time dimensions, right? That's my prayer of like saying like, hopefully we learn from the past our history, like not to relive a public revolt and all the genocide and bloodshed that happened. But I'm trying to tell it in a in a because if I if I were to tell it in an old school way, I, I bet you like your demographic, the people that are here will pay attention to it. But if you see characters like this and like polished and presented in a futuristic kind of way, then that gives me a bigger um, advantage or opportunity to talk to more people. But I really commend History Colorado to take a chance in having this type of show because that's normally not what they do. But to really work with an artist and to give uh, the artist um, not free reign, but just like a bigger um, uh, opportunity to present their artwork, and then again to really attract a different time of uh, type, uh, different age group to a history museum. But um, yeah, it all works together, and the prayer in the end is to not repeat our history and tell uh, exactly what happened. Like everybody came together and lived in peace again. But it's all positivity behind it, but including our truth. <laughs> and having people acknowledge what happened, the atrocities, the bloodshed, the rapes, you know, all the murders and stuff that happened in the name of looking for riches and gold and converting into a religion. You know, when we already, we don't have a religion as religious people, it's a way of life. But uh, to be forced into that is, you know, there's a lot of people that, not only indigenous people that went through that, but a lot of people don't know our stories. And, you know, when I rent cars in other cities, they're like, oh, we need your passport. Like, I'm not from Mexico, I'm from <laughs> New Mexico. So, I mean, it's just funny like that. They don't think we're still here, but slowly it's catching on. And that's the prayer in the end, is to acknowledge the people that are here, the lands, and um, know the real story, which, is, which are not taught in schools or um, in textbooks. So I think this way that's been working for over 20 years now to present it in an art, um, art presentation. Thanks. Thank you guys. Have a good evening.